Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Symposium. So, as you may know, Adam Frazier has been the host of Symposium for quite some time. And no, Adam has not lost all his hair. This is actually me, John DeGoes, who is taking over as the new host of Symposium. For the past four years, I would say, I've been doing a lot of private teaching and mentoring in the Spartan program. And finally, it's time to open this up to the public, get more people involved, and also hopefully expand to broader audiences of developers than I could reach in the Spartan program. Meanwhile, I wanna give a huge thanks to past hosts of this series, including Adam Frazier, who's done an incredible job building a great community around Scala and Zio and uh, around a culture of mentorship that helps people understand how open source libraries are built, how they work, and how you can use them, as well as a huge thanks to Kit Langton, who was co-host of this show for, for quite some time uh, back uh, a year, year and a half ago. All right, so what I am doing as the new host of Symposium is my first series is on building better open source. And what this series is really about is how to leverage everything that we possibly can leverage in order to make the most successful open source software that radically improves the way we build software. That's pretty big, right? It's very generic and very far reaching. It can encompass a lot of stuff. Uh, why me? Well, first off, I'm a longtime contributor to open source. I'm a huge fan of open source. My first open source project was this little project, uh, probably no one can remember it. You can still find it. If you look really hard, you can still find it. It's a library called Stacks. And what it was intended to be is like this batteries included kit. If you wanted to do functional programming in this little esoteric language called Hacks, uh, which was an action script variant with, with strong types. I think it's still around actually, it used a lot in game programming. And then from there, I went on to do Lift JSON and Blue Eyes and Scala Z and Zio and lots of other open source projects along the way. I love building open source. And I also love thinking about open source as startups. I'm an entrepreneur and I like to build products and I like to see products be successful. So I like to bring that business side, my business hat, if you will, into open source development. And um, in addition, I've had the, the privilege, I think over the past, probably seven, eight years to help a tremendous number of developers around the world uh, learn how to become better at building great software. And that's a passion of mine. And it's something I, I love doing. So that's why I'm here with you all today, hosting this new series on building open source. Now, in this series, what we're going to take a look at is a number of different dimensions and, and aspects that go into any successful open source, one of which is the value proposition and focus. So even though that's not necessarily code related per se, still we'll take a look at the uh, value prop and the focus of an open source project as a way of helping that open source project become successful. Every open source project does need a value proposition. It does need a pitch. It needs a reason for you to use it. And if that isn't clear, then the project's going to flounder and it's not going to be as successful as it could be. So we'll, we'll be taking a look at that in some cases. We will also look at a big, a big favorite topic of mine, which is vastly undercovered, in my opinion, which is code organization. Okay, I'm a stickler for detail. I think it matters where you put those functions, what package you put them in, whether you put them in a class or, or a static at the top level. I think all these details really matter if you're trying to build a successful open source project. And part of that is it matters for end users, right? It matters for end users because if the code is well organized, they know where to look to find what they're looking for, then they're going to be more successful. And if they're more successful, then you're going to get more adopters and that open source project will end up becoming more used in industry. But then also it matters for contributors because there's uh, nothing quite as daunting as jumping into an open source project and wanting to make your first contribution and then discovering this blob of code, these files that contain 10,000 lines of 
code that's poorly organized and you don't know where to begin or where to put your changes or where to even look, that can be very detrimental to growth of an open source project contributor base. So we'll take a look at code organization from both the perspective of how can we organize this code better for users, but also how can we organize the code better so people know where to look when they're trying to contribute. We will also take a look at algorithms and data structures. So e even though computer science uh, is perhaps not as uh, relevant, or computer science problems and esoterica is not as relevant to the day-to-day -day programming, sometimes when you are building foundational open source libraries, it actually matters. Are you going to use a tree map or are you going to use a sorted array, right? There's there's different questions that come into play when you're building some of these libraries and we'll work through issues involving algorithms and data structures. In addition, we're going to spend hopefully a good chunk of time looking at developer experience, okay? So that moment when a developer sees your software, what does that look like to them? What is the hello world in that open source framework or library? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? We're gonna look at that. And then we're also gonna look at the evolving story. Okay, you've seen the hello world. Now you want to solve this use case. How easy is it to do that? And and that will come down to the, the way you've organized your code. It will come down to the names that you've chosen. It will come down to whether you've chosen to model this in an imperative fashion or a more declarative fashion. It'll come down to a lot of these different things that we actually have a lot of control over. And by tweaking these knobs and pushing these buttons and monkeying around with the way you're packaging up your solution, you can actually create uh, anywhere from a terrible user experience, something that's that's not going to attract users or contributors to an amazing developer experience. And, and the type of experience that I'm going to be trying to focus on is how can we make it so a developer uses our library or framework and they're just in heaven, right? They're, they, they are overjoyed uh, at the power that this gives them, the fact that it stays out of their way, let the, lets them solve problems that they couldn't solve before in ways they couldn't even have imagined before. We're going to focus on that developer experience story. And, and we'll also learn about trade-offs because sometimes there are trade-offs. Sometimes you have to decide, is this a library for the power users or is this a library for the new users? Hopefully you, you have a a range in there from like the newish user to the more advanced or intermediate user. But sometimes you do have to make trade-offs. Sometimes a library that's designed to help you solve any problem in the world cannot be really, really great at solving one particular class of problems. And so it can be worse for some market. But we'll, we'll take a look at those trade-offs and talk about them when we run into them. In addition, I am a fan of static types, big fan of static types. And so one of the things that I would like to help developers with is using static type systems and especially advanced static type systems like those in Haskell and Scala and Rust and so forth in order to improve the design of their open source library. And examples would be cutting down on runtime errors. And the, if you do have a very powerful type system, you can use that to cut down on runtime errors, which is going to lead to a better experience for developers who are using this uh, open source library and a better experience for companies who have chosen to adopt your open source library. And over time, that can actually mean a lot. If your library develops a reputation as the library you build software in and you go to run it that first time and it just works, then more and more uh, people will be interested in using it and companies will be interested in retaining that software inside their organization because it helps them be successful. And then also, if you are in the fan of people who don't find tests particularly fun to write, and I will admit that I am in that group, even though Copilot has, has made uh, that situation better, then you will appreciate that the use of static types can decrease the number of unit tests you have to write. Never totally eliminates the need for testing because we can't prove everything in the type system, even if we could, and we can in some languages, we wouldn't want to because it's much too costly, but it can reduce the number of sort of boilerplate nonsense tests that we have to write if we're able to encode more properties of the software we're designing in the type system. In addition, we will look at macros. Macros 
have a dirty reputation in some communities, and I totally understand why that is. But the reality is macros can eliminate huge amounts of boilerplate and be used to improve performance. And if you're building open source, you can't ignore them. They're just too powerful. They have the ability to turn a library that's only ever going to be modestly successful into one that can be incredibly successful because they can just totally eliminate huge classes of boilerplate that you might not be able to do at all with value level abstraction. Or maybe you can do it with value level abstraction, but it's too it's too painful, it's too boilerplate or it's too slow. And macros allow you that workaround. They are the escape hatch that allows you to solve many problems you can't solve in another way. So we'll, we'll take a look at how macros can be used to improve the design of these open source libraries. In addition, I'm a fan of functional programming and I believe that functional programming can be used to improve testability and reasonability and also maintainability of software applications through techniques like inversion of control. And what we'll be looking at is how we can use techniques from functional programming in order to improve the design of our libraries. Composition is a big thing. A compositional library can allow you to solve a huge number of problems in a relatively small package that's easy to get your mind around. And so we'll look at using techniques like composition whether that's in a purely functional context or not a purely functional context, we'll see how many concepts in FP can be used to improve the open source software that we build. And then uh, beyond all of this stuff, which is a uh, very highly technical, I would say, we're also uh, hopefully in some cases going to look at marketing and documentation. Uh, sometimes an open source library might be great at everything except for marketing, or it might be really amazing but have no documentation. And so we'll take a look at how we can improve documentation, how we can structure documentation, how we can um, market. Uh, if you do have an open source library, how do you get the word out? How do you get people using it? How do you get people giving feedback? And, and we'll take a look for open source projects that are struggling with those issues. We'll take a look at those issues as well. So how is this going to work? Well, I'm still figuring that out, but you know, this is what I'm going to propose and what we'll start with, and then we'll iterate based on the success or failure that we see with this process. First off, I need a brave volunteer, brave volunteer to bring their open source project into Zymposium. And my only requirement is that it has to be a project you contribute to. <laughs> so obviously it'd be great to take someone else's project and work on it, but you know, just to I feel like wh whoever is bringing me a project should have some ownership in that project, some stake in its success. And, uh, and, and we'll look at anything, you know, we'll look at anything in there. Um, I would say that if you bring a project to this symposium series, come ready to go, right? You should have that project ready to build, ready to compile, ready to test. So any sort of changes we make, we have instant feedback on whether or not they're going to work. And in addition, I would say come with one specific goal in mind, uh, because there's probably 20 different ways we could improve an open source library, but we can't do all of that inside the context of a single session. So come with one specific goal in mind, and I'll give you some examples. You might say, hey, John, I want to improve the developer experience of this library. I know it's kind of hard to use this. Or maybe it's easy to use in the simple cases, but it's ridiculously complicated in the hard cases. Uh, or maybe like it's reasonably easy to use, but people just aren't getting the names or the concepts. And I want to improve the developer experience. Okay, we'll work on improving the developer experience of this library. Or you might come to me and say, I'm not convinced I have, you know, product market fit. Or in an open source project, you might call that project market fit. And you might say, uh, maybe we should work on that, right? Do, do we know what market this open source project is built for? Do we know why people should choose this instead of everything else? Do we know why this there's a reason for this thing to exist and for people to use it? If the answer is no, then if you're having trouble gaining traction, then it, it then that that's probably it probably comes back to to the fact that you have not yet achieved project market fit. But most of these open source projects out there, they are built in response to pains that developers have 
So even if they're not exactly solving a, a pain point that's significant for uh, a reasonable percentage of developers in that space, it's probably not too far from something that is. So probably by tweaking some stuff, we can take a project that has no project market fit and we can bring it to something that does have project market fit by paying attention to details. You might also come to me and say, this, this project is you know in pretty good shape, but the performance is not where I need it to be. And I need to improve by two times or five times or 10 times. And so we'll look at everything from high level optimizations around algorithms and data structures and the way this is structured architecture to low level optimizations, including like, you know, lookup tables or minimizing allocations, minimizing virtual dispatch, all of the techniques we can use to make screaming fast code in a given language and platform combination. Uh, you, you might also say, well, let's work on architecture, right? You're, you've got a lot of details, right? But you're not concerned if the big picture architecture of your application is able to uh, robustly integrate uh, new features and revise features and, and maybe isn't as extensible as it needs to be or as modular or as testable. And so we can uh, spend a session working solely on the architecture of this open source library. Also organization, you know, a lot of, if you're a newer dev developer, then uh, there's two things you're probably gonna find tricky. Uh, one is debugging, you know, debugging is a skill and you get better the more you practice at it. When you've been debugging for 20 years, you'll be able to do things that you never thought you would be able to do if you've only been programming for five years. And then the other one is code organization. And code organization is very much a skill. It's not a science. There's not a recipe you can follow to organize code well. That comes down to having organized a lot of code in a lot of different languages for a lot of different domains. And so code, code organization can be one of those things you bring your open source project to me and say, hey, let's improve the organization of this to make it more accessible to users and contributors. You might also come to me and say, let's work on marketing. Let's spend a whole symposium session doing nothing but talking about marketing. Are we selling this open source library in the right way in terms of, are we describing it in a way that actually connects with the pains that developers in its market, target market actually feel? Are we talking about it in the right way? Do we need to write blog posts? Do we need documentation? Do we need video tutorials? What do we need in order to get the word out about this great open source project? And also documentation. You can even come and say, hey, I really don't know where to begin. How do we structure this documentation? What should be in it? How, how, are, we, how are we going to know what to document? Given finite resources of all open source contributors, how do we know what to document and, how, and what to leave to sort of the code docs? What do we have to put in the high level docs in order to get people interested? So in every session, we're gonna spend anywhere from one to two hours working together on this project. And you might, in fact, I'd say it's highly likely that you're gonna get homework assignments for all the stuff we're not able to complete inside that session. So in, in some cases, we'll be able to solve a problem entirely. But in other cases, we're gonna make some progress and we're gonna work on the high level sort of changes we need to make, but then I'm gonna give you home assignments so you can take back and you can work on them nights and weekends type thing in order to improve the structure, organization, performance, or documentation or whatever of these open source projects. And you are welcome to come back. So you can come back more later. It doesn't have to be one symposium per open source project for all time. If you feel like you would benefit from ongoing assistance, then bring your open source project back and we will take a look at it. And through all of these different things that we're gonna be doing, it is my hope that uh, we are able to uh, produce uh, next level open source software, right? There's lots of great projects, but my goal is to help push them even further and to take advantage of my learnings in open source to help these open source projects become as successful as they deserve to be. And also to build the next generation of open source contributors who can go out there and make open source software that really changes the world, right? You should be able to go out there and you should be able to make amazing software that inspires people and gets them excited and solves the problems that people face when they're trying to solve their, their day job issues. And that's my goal in this series. And if you are not an open source contributor, 
then you might be wondering, well, should I be here? The answer is yes, you should be here. Why? Because you will become a better software engineer by learning all of the tools and techniques and tricks that people use when they're crafting really amazing open source libraries and frameworks. Open source is an opportunity to do things right. At, at our day jobs, we have to cut corners. That's a reality of being paid to produce software is we've got to cut corners. We've got to introduce intentionally, in some cases, introduce technical debt. Every line of code is arguably technical debt, but sometimes we have to even go further than that and implement things in suboptimal ways because we don't have time to do better. And sometimes, you know, companies can go out of business if they're not able to produce value quickly enough for their end users. And so we have to be aware of that as software engineers and we have to be pragmatic. And that means that the software we produce at our day jobs is not always the best software. However, open source is by and large, it is built by people who are spending their free time building it. And in our free time, no one's paying us for this. We're doing it for the fun of it. So if we want to make great software, guess what? We are going to make great software. And that's why I think the quality of uh, software in the open source ecosystem is actually very, very high. There's some amazing, amazing software out there in every language ecosystem that just demonstrates extremely good organization and great use of algorithms and data structures and great performance and type safety and compositionality and all these um, properties of amazing open source software that, that build really big fanatical bases of users who love to use these open source solutions. It's amazing. And there is so much that the nine to five software developer can learn about how you write good code by looking at these role models. That's not to say that you're always gonna be able to use all these same techniques. And that's not to say that you're never gonna to have to cut corners or introduce technical debt because those things are not true. But by looking into this world where people spend their own time working on this beautiful software that they're creating because they want to solve a problem in a, in a great way, it is a fantastic opportunity for you to take your knowledge and your skills in software engineering to the next level. Now, everything you learn here is going to be applicable. I mean, stuff we talked about, marketing and project market fit and documentation, uh, probably not, not to most of you. I mean, some of you, if you're building a developer-focused solution infrastructure like Twilio or whatnot, then I suppose that even that could be useful. Um, but most, the vast majority of stuff we look at like developer experience, right? Every single developer in your organization, every code they write, it should be geared to be read by other developers because we spend the vast majority of our time reading code that we, we wrote and that other developers wrote. So having good experience for people who are interacting with that code is important, but also code, code organization, tremendously important. Algorithms and data structures, same story, type safety, uh, appropriate judicious use of macros, FP techniques like composition and testability and maintainability, um, uh, architecture, all of these different things, I guarantee you they do apply and they probably should apply even more in all of the commercial software that you write. So please, if you are an open source contributor, then bring your project to the next symposium series and we will take a look at it. If you are not an open source contributor, then come to the next symposium series where we will learn together how to build great software that in this case happens to be open source. All right, so that concludes my introduction. What I'm gonna do now is take questions. And we've got one question from Baldwin on Will the new symposium series still go on YouTube as previously? Yes, absolutely. So the new series will be edited and placed on that channel. So we're going to continue to build on the fantastic content that Adam Fraser and Kit Langton have created over the years. Nabil asks, do we use some chat, Discord, 
So I, I think there will be a room for a transitionary period where we use uh, Discord, the existing Discord. I think moving forward, though, what we're trying to do is simplify this experience and make it accessible to uh, even bigger audiences of developers. And so that means we're going to try to stay on the facilities that this Zoom webinar gives us. And I know some of you are tuning in actually not from Zoom, but from, let's see here, Algora's TV product, right? We've got we've got some people from Algora's TV product. So hi there. Welcome. Glad you were able to join. You won't be able to interact, I don't think, in that forum, but you can certainly follow along. For interaction, we'll be trying to use uh, uh, this Zoom product just for simplifying the process. Nabil asks, how about working on specific tickets that we might struggle with? Absolutely. So if you like are working in the Scala ecosystem and you're working on a Zeo project and you have a ticket, you don't know how to solve it and, and you want some help, bring it in here, right? We're going to take a look at that because one of the things that I think that's essential for open source contributors to learn is how to contribute to open source. And and many of you are in the situation where you might be dipping your toes into open source. You haven't built anything yourself, but you are trying to get started. And one of the most important skills you can learn is how to dive in, how to take that first step. And you don't have to know everything. It's okay not to know everything. There's actually a process you can use. And that process can allow you to achieve success even if you're working in a code base that you're largely unfamiliar with. So we can talk about that. We can basically, oh, here's our ticket and uh, here's the code. How do we know where in the code we have to edit in order to implement that ticket? That's the number one problem that a new open source contributor faces is where do I make the changes? And the second problem is what should those changes be in order to accomplish the effect of the ticket? We can look at both of those and we can look at other issues. So if all you wanna do is bring a ticket and uh, work on that ticket with me, then I think that's going to teach a lot about good open source development, and it's definitely applicable for this series. And then Damien asks, what are the restrictions to this project? Only Scala, only in the Zeo community? No. I imagine that uh, due to probably the makeup of this initial audience, the vast majority of our work is going to be with Scala, and a good chunk of it will be with Zeo, but there are no restrictions to this new series. So if you have something in Scala, but not Zeo related, bring it in. We'll take a look. If you have something not in Scala, in TypeScript or Clojure or Rust or C, C++, bring it in. Right? A lot of the principles of successful open source development apply regardless of language. Now, the exact interface you might choose to build for a user of this open source library is going to depend a lot on the capabilities and the syntax of the language that you're using. So that's going to be very language specific. But a lot of the other stuff on code organization and architecture and performance and just on and on and on, it's, it's all the same across all open project mark, market fit and marketing. All that is the same across all different programming languages. So the only caveat I would add there is obviously I'm going to be more productive on languages I know. <laughs> but that said, if you bring to me something uh, built in, in Racket, and you want to work on that, okay, let's do it. You might have to tell me what's going on. I might have some questions for you about this or that, but I am more than willing to work in any programming language that you are uh, brave enough to bring into the project. Baldwin asks, where can we sign up our projects for future sessions? That's a really excellent question. So what I would say is um, you are welcome to contact me on Discord or on Twitter or on LinkedIn. And just, uh, I would ask for heads up Obviously, if we if we have no pending project and someone comes in and says, hey, let's just do this, then I'm going to do that. Uh, but it would be nice to get like a one week heads up on uh, on someone's attempt to bring a project into the session. And my goal, we'll have to see how this works out, but my goal is roughly one session or one open source project per session. But also, if you come in and you, you only need 20 minutes or maybe even 10 minutes of help, then we can go ahead and move on to another open source project and fit a few of them in the course of a single symposium. Nabil asks, do you think about streaming on Twitch too? Yeah, that's actually, that's a good idea. And then finally, Peter asks, can we involve Rust-based projects also? Yes, 
Absolutely. I would love to see some Rust here. So if you're working on anything in open source Rust, then bring that on. Again, many of the principles and techniques of building highly successful open source projects are going to apply regardless of language. And we can all learn by looking at all of these languages. That said, I, I do expect for uh, the short to me midi medium term, I think, uh, to probably be mostly be Scala. And that's just because based uh, the, the number of people who are already following Symposium who are working in the Scala community. But, you know, it'd be great to see some TypeScript too, right? If Effect open source projects, anyone with the Effect ecosystem who wants to bring something in, that'd be fun to work on. And also Rust, you know, any anything. I'm up for anything. All right, fantastic set of initial questions. Anything else? Looks like I've gotten through all of these. Just double check, make sure I haven't missed anything. Yeah, just PM me on Discord, just to make sure that I don't uh, miss that. Just send me a direct message on Discord and I will get that and you can sign up for a slot. All right, looks like I've gotten through all the questions now. So uh, we, we do have 25 minutes. Does anyone have a ready to go open source project that they would like to take a look at today? I know it's last minute notice, so we might not have any brave enough volunteers, but if we do, I am happy to dive into something today. Or we'll just wait till next week when it looks like we'll have at least one, maybe more volunteers. Ooh, Nabil has something. All right, Nabil, let's go ahead and promote you to a panelist. All right. Hello. Hello, hello. Hey, how's it going? A long time no see. Good. Yeah. Two months anyway. Uh, uh, around about, around about. Um, so what would you like to take a look so at today? I, I, I actually would have, um, I guess, at least two, maybe even three ideas of, of things that I think could be beneficial maybe i i tell you what i have in my mind and uh maybe you can give me some feedback what you think might might be a good fit yes um so there are two zero http things which i think need some some love and uh one of it already has like a pull request that was this um with the handling for the bad requests I mean, you you know the details of of the state. Yes. I guess you made a review, and I didn't have time to to work on that further recently. But uh, yeah, I think this is something a lot of people were struggling with and asking for. Like, how can we actually see the errors? We only see five hundred and then nothing. Yes, and yeah. Uh, Why don't we take a look at that one? If you're ready to go with that. Yeah, sure. Yes. All right. So. Uh, for context, for folks who are new to the Zio ecosystem, Zio HTTP is the sort of standard HTTP library. And Nabil's been working on adding a feature that produces better error messages in the event that you interact with a, an API using data that has the wrong shape or structure or type. And where this comes into play is ZOHGP has this high-level API that's called Endpoint. And Endpoint lets you declaratively describe your endpoints using pure data. And then based on this data, it actually generates all the boilerplate necessary, including encoding and decoding and whatnot, and leaves you free to focus on the sort of business logic. Everything else is handled by ZOHGP. And this is really nice to use. It lets you use your own error types like domain error types and and lets you use your own success values and, and everything that you would expect. But it, it has had a major drawback to date. And that drawback is if you if, if a client interacts with your endpoints in a way that's not expected, then you basically don't get any actionable error message out. I mean, there was some header appended, but it's not using the same error machinery that the rest of your application would be using. And, and that's that's an issue because as a developer who's building an API, you want a uniform way of reporting errors to clients who are interacting with your API. So that means if they call your API and they forget a field, they should get back the same structured information that they get back if they do send that field, but they actually used a wrong value for it. So uniform error response is very important in designing these APIs. 
and Zio HTTP did not provide a way to flexibly handle the um, sort of uh, codec, they're called codec errors that are produced by requests or responses having wrong structure. And Nabil is working on this very important issue and he's submitted a pull request that I've actually had the opportunity to review one time, although I don't know where it's at now. All right, with that background out of the way, Nabil, are you able to share your screen so yes. we can take a look at the state of this? I am. I just need to clean up a little bit. My desktop was not prepared for sharing, <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay. I, I managed. So I need to hit the button correctly for sharing. There we go. There I we can are. see it. Fantastic. So there are actually... Um, there's also another thought that I had that I, I realized I, I was missing, and that is, so I implemented it for the server part, right? But it actually yeah. also needs an implementation in the client. Yes. Because you also, when, so so maybe for context, again, for, for people who are not so familiar with the HTTP, so this endpoint API is not only like giving you the opportunity to implement it in the server way, but also in a client way. And there, of course, you have the same problem, like, you just get back like a 500, right? And it says like, okay, I, I didn't expect a 500. And then it's like a failure and you can do basically nothing with it. But you would at least like to have some some better information about like what error it is. And, and that's currently also not happening. Um, but since I started already with the, with the server part, I think it might be wise to to focus on, on the server part first. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, I actually didn't didn't do a lot, uh, actually nothing, <laughs> since you reviewed it. So yes. I, I guess you are quite up to date. Okay, but maybe <laughs> that to, makes it to, simpler. To check on, yeah, but maybe to to let people know what what I was working on or struggling with. So I came up here with this with this data structure um, that has basically uh, two use cases. Um, something for logging and something that that takes like um, the error type and is able to transform the generic UHTP error type to a user specific error type, and then a codec which is responsible for uh, giving back an output of this custom data type in a way that is user usable, whatever that means, right? So this could be HTML, that could be JSON, that could be a, something that you defined in your application in the way you need it. And uh, there is like some some um, some default thing here, which we can see here, which is basically JSON or HTML. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, and uh, as John then mentioned, I think totally rightfully in, in the pull request that he thinks that data structure is too complex and probably doesn't really uh, fit the purpose. And I had a similar feeling, but um, I, I was going first with something that at least fulfills its purpose and then wanted to get some feedback, which I did yes. through a pull request. And I think this is also something important to learn if you are like con contributing to um, open source, I guess, you, so, you know. Learn by pull request, right? It's, learn by pull request, right? Yeah. But also, you, on the other hand, you know, you, you, you shouldn't just open a pull request for, for any shitty code, something that you would not accept yourself, right? But it's yeah. okay to to ask for help and, and to, to do some improvements later on. Um, right. you, you, you should put some effort into it. You You, you should try to strive for something that that is usable but that doesn't mean that you always can and and i guess it's also like one of the purposes of of this whole setup right john to 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 teach people to, right. to be more able to yes. produce something of quality sure. that then of course also maybe helps other other people in the open source community to have less review work to do <laughs> <laughs> yes that, that would be nice <laughs> If we, yeah. if we start making better open source contributors, we'll have less work to do when we review yes. their pull requests. Uh, I I think so. I so mentioned I think, it before. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it before, right? That we have like the server client component, and I think that's also where one of the, the issues here lies a little bit, because usually we always have we always have this 
um, if if we have like something that is an input or an output and, and we want to change the the way it is processed, yeah. we usually always give uh, two functions, like one function that is transforming into the new thing and one thing yes. that transforms from the new thing into the old thing, something like this. That's right. And I think the use case here is a bit different because I don't think you ever want to produce these zero internal errors. You only want to consume them. Right, and that can simplify the structure. Uh, and I was yes. thinking about that a bit. Um, okay, so he here's the situation. We want to allow the user to grab one of these codec errors, which they don't ordinarily see, right? A codec error is yeah. something that happens when um, ZO endpoints automatic decoder and encoder fail to find the structure that they're expecting. So ordinarily you don't see that, but but it will happen if someone uses your API incorrectly. And what we want them to be able to do is take one of these internal codec errors and format that in JSON or HTML yes. or whatever way makes sense. And it's consistent with how they handle their own domain errors. So that's a good goal. As, as a user, our user story might be, as a user, I want to be able to take codec errors and put them in the same format that all my other errors are returned to the user, right? That's a reasonable goal. So that, that's one of our requirements. Any solution that we come up with, it has to satisfy that requirement. Now there's another thing to build, which I was thinking about, which is the client side. Okay, so this yes. automatically, you know, once we allow a user to plug something in here on line 53, it's gonna allow them to take one of the Kodak errors and turn it into whatever kind of JSON they want or whatever. Um, but then we have, the flip side, which is on the client side, let's say I'm using the automatic type safe client that Zio endpoint gives me for free. Now yes. I'm calling against this API and um, and I get back some JSON, let's say JSON, that was produced by this codec error handler. Yeah, what, do I, what, you... what do I expect to happen? Right, right. I, I was trying to answer that I, question as a user. What do I, what do I want to happen? I mean, it, it's almost actually, like a defect, right? Yeah, if yes. I call into that API, uh, I'm using the Zio endpoint client that's automatically generated, yes. and then the server is automatically generated from the endpoint as well, right? So I'm using all this auto code. I get a failure. Uh oh, what happened? It has. It almost yeah. has to be like either a bug in Zio HTTP, which we don't need to design for. Bugs will happen, but we don't design for them. Or yes. it could be a version mis mismatch, right? I am my client is like a newer or older version interacting with a server that has a different version, and, and that's not a recoverable error. I, I came to the that's conclusion true. that that's probably not a recoverable error. I, I, I have another and have another option how it could fail, but that is also not a recoverable error because we allow the a user since RC5 um, to self-define basically how things should be serialized and deserialized. And if there is a bug in this, which could be on the user code side, right? Because yeah. he could write this himself. It would also lead to some kind of, of error in, in this fashion and or, or could lead to uh, an error in this fashion. But this yeah. is also not recoverable. Like if, if your serializer or deserializer doesn't work, what do you want to do? nobody will come <laughs> and uh, right. uh, have, have a... You can't try to have that. Fallback. Yeah, you, you don't have a fallback uh, serializer, right? You don't yes. have five JSON serializers. So in here's library. a proposal. Here's a proposal. Yeah. As a user, I can take the HTTP codec error and I can turn it into any sort of response I want. That's one user story. Okay? Yeah. Um, um, as a user of the automatic client, if I call if I call the um, wrong version of my API, then I get back a non-recoverable error that informs me of what went wrong. And, and that becomes our requirement for the client side of things. Our requirement for the server side of things is that we be able to format these codec errors into specific um, response bodies. And then for the automatic client side of things, our requirement becomes the ability to 
fail in a non-recoverable way. I don't think it's useful to fail in a recoverable way there. Um, but however non-recoverable it should be, it needs to at least allow us to diagnose what went wrong. In the log, we should see that there was a problem and we should know, oh, well, I tried to call a new version of the server with my old client. Does that seem reasonable? Yes, yes, sure. Um, okay, so th there's good news when here. You say, when, when you say version, right? I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I, I, I mean, sure, it could well, be like a version issue, right? It might but also be that, I don't know, you know, our architecture guides at our company or something says like, don't share code and I re-implemented the thing and I made a mistake. Sure, yeah, it could be a mistake. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it could be a mistake if you created if you created an endpoint merely so you could get your free client and not so you could also implement the server and get the free clients, then there could be a mismatch just because you made a mistake. So if yes. you're using Zio endpoint just for the free client, then that could yeah. explain the problem. But also, uh, if you're calling the wrong version, and, and and also, like I said before, there could be a bug in Zio HTTP, which I don't think we should design the API for. API should not be designed with the possibility of bugs in mind. Yes. Uh, okay. So the good news is that these requirements allow us to simplify the design of this API. We don't, I'm convinced we don't need a type parameter here for Kodak error handler. And you can even see that in this design, you're using wildcard. Yeah. So it's like it's a fake type parameter because it's not actually being specified here. So I think we can delete this type parameter. Yeah. I would just blow it away. Let's zoom in do you here. think do you think we need the data structure or would you put the stuff just directly into the endpoint itself? Uh, let's let's wait to decide that. <laughs> I think that if we end up wrapping one thing, then we'll inline it. But if we end up saying, oh, we need two three two things or maybe three things, in that case, we keep it as a standalone data type. Uh, by the way, I think one requirement that I would also make is. Um, I think you should be able to have like an easy way to turn on and off logging how you like independent of the response. Um, because maybe for some reason you explicitly do not want to return a response for, I don't know, security reasons or something like this. Situations like this do definitely exist. I, I know of these kind of situations where you do want to hide the errors that you produce. Yeah. But you want to have logging. You don't want to turn off both at the same time, or you don't want to turn on both at the same time. Okay. So could that be accomplished in like middleware? Um, I thought about this, and I think in the current design, let me let me know if I might be wrong, but I think it's not possible because if we take a look at uh, at the server handler, uh, sorry, it's not the server handler, it's in the... It's an endpoint. It's an endpoint. And we take a look. I should use the right tool for the right thing. Uh, in a moment, we take a look. Well, at well here, actually, this is a, a little bit of a rabbit hole. It's a useful one to explore. But let's back up a little bit and see if we can make a little bit of progress here. It's okay. Uh, I think we should keep in mind the requirement to. to it's do it's it's lot. just it's it, it's just the only thing I say is we we generate already a response from the codec errors in the implement yeah. method. Yeah. And if we then want to put something from the outside, we don't have the codec error anymore. It's already gone. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's just all blown away at that point. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, all right. So what I would like to do here is just think for a little bit about um, our requirement. As a user, I can take an HTTP codec error and turn that into any type of response I want. Right, we we agreed with that. So yes, I I mean it, this is kind of what I'm doing here, right? Because this function takes an HTTP codec error, it returns something, and the so codec is is how the response is produced. Right. So it it's producing this thing called error, which is different potentially than the user's domain error, right? It's just producing this some type, but the, the thing is, it's only producing this type in order to be able to convert it to a response. So that codec there in line 67, that codec says, I can turn an error 
into a response. Yes. Um, so, okay. But, but a codec, the point of a codec is it's invertibility. So it not only allows us to turn the air into the response, but also the yes. response into the air. I, I, but, I know what you mean. I, I kind of abuse it a bit. I, I, I agree with you, but I had, uh, uh, a use case in mind for the codec, right? Because mm -hmm. the codec stores also schema information. And then the schema information I can use to generate documentation for this endpoint. And that this endpoint might fail with something in the documentation, All which right, I here. could not if Hear I would out. have just a function to respond. Hear me out. Uh, copy, copy line 67. And let's bring yes. it up. Uh, I don't think this does everything entirely, but copy it up to the top. You mean uh, here. paste it in here? Yep. And what if instead of air here, we change that to HTTP codec air? And then let's delete map yeah. air in line 13. Let's delete log because we can already log these things through the codec, I believe. Because the codec says if we have an error, we can turn it into a response. If we can turn it into a response, then we can log it. Right? You can automatically convert it to a string. I don't know what that log was being used for, but if it's just debugging so, purposes, then we, we can but, just... Yeah, but that's, that's, that's what I was talking about before, right? If I need to first create a response that yeah. then I base the logging on, then I can, then I have to turn the error into a response with the information that I need for the logging. But I might want to only log without doing that. But it has to end up as a response. The error has to end up as a response anyway, right? Yeah, yes, but I think inside the codec itself, I could not define logging because I think the uh, codecs, uh, they do not if, um, accept anywhere effects when I transform them or something like this. It's all pure. Right. Um, so, so is it just that you would want to be able to log during the decoding process? I think we should solve that in a different way. And I think we should solve it in a different yeah. place in the code. Maybe, maybe. But, but, but okay. you so know, let's... It's, it's, it's closely related, right? Because it was basically the decision, what do I want to do? Do I want to solve uh, the problem of, I need to see the error on the server side or on the client side? I, I would like to see, do you have any example where that log function is called? I would like to understand better the requirements that are that that, that log function is so, so, satisfying. So, so... So I, what, what I basically would like to do or, or end up with is something like, you know, I, I just say, um, you know, I, I have something that takes an HTTP request, right? It, it yeah. returns a log, uh, an HTTP uh, codec error, sorry, and, and returns me a log message, right? And, or, or, or actually, I would even be fine to say it doesn't need to be a log as, uh, explicitly, right? I, it could just be a tap. And then I can do in it whatever I want. It could be logging, yeah. could be something else, could be writing to a, a file. I don't care, right? But I think the the thing that I want to do is I want to give the user the freedom to decide if there is an error. I want to perform a side effect on the error that does not require me to produce a response with the same information, but it could be just like a very simple response that is independent of that. Sure, sure. So. I think that is, I, I see what you're trying to do. And I think that that's valuable. I think that that's almost orthogonal from the current discussion, because you might want that about any type of error, right? You might want the ability to just win any sort of error, including Maybe. one of these pure errors is produced. You might want the ability to do something on the side, whether that's dump it to a log file or print it out for debugging or whatever. So I think that is useful and could be done almost generically with another field inside that endpoint structure that says, hey, you, you've made some error. What do you want to do with it? Right. So let's untangle I, that from the current one just for the moment. Actually, in general, right, we have these capabilities already on the level of a root or multiple routes. Yes. Uh, but the problem with the implementation of how this, this errors are handled, the endpoint makes it impossible to see these errors at this place because they are already handled when you yes. would be able to call the function. Right, because when you convert an endpoint to a route, everything's done. It's all packaged up into yes. this tiny little thing that is ready to go, yes. All right, well, we can think about that too. Maybe that could be another way to solve that problem.
is, is to somehow change that mechanism. But yeah, and and but uh, for now, I would say let's let's so just just one final thought on this. Yeah. If we would do that, right, it would be also very good from a user perspective because I don't have to define this error handling in every endpoint, but I right. could do it once at the end of my application. That's right. That's right. All right, so let's think more about that as a potential fix to the use case you identified. And now let's consider, can we do everything that we need to with this type? And we only have a few more minutes before I'm gonna have to run, but there's one very important part of your solution here that uh, we've changed. And I wanna take a look at that more. Go down to that chunk of media type with Q, oh, uh, with yes. Q factor, right? So this is saying, give me both the air and then this chunk and I'll give you back a response. Basically, you know, it's saying, give me the the codec air, give me all of these media types and I'll yes. give you back a response. And the media types are the things that the client say I accept because I cannot just yes. return any error, right? So client might tell me which kind of error he understands. Right. So I, I think to rephrase this, requirement in a higher level, what we're trying to say is that as a user, I should be able to vary the way that I encode the codec error yes. based on the accept header. Yes. Okay. Let's go back up to the top now that I very clearly understand that requirement and say, does this give us the ability to do this? I think the answer is no. And uh, the reason I think that is because um, response type there is basically it's it's a recipe to produce a response. So this allows us to convert from a codec error into a response, but we're not allowed to make any sort of decision based on the accept header, yes. right? There's no decision process that could be made. So what if... I'm just trying to do the simplest possible thing that could work here. And I understand that it might lead to usability issues we have to solve later. But let's just imagine for a second that instead of a codec here, we stored a map. Can you modify the type there? Uh, but by the way, I, I would have also one one idea. Don't know how good it is, but Go ahead. we could also say, since this is our internal error type, right? We can do with, with it whatever we want. We could say it has the... Uh, like if, as soon as you create one, you have to provide an information about what accept types the client understand and put it in. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that that might uh, create a problem because uh, because then it's how are you going to invert that? Um, show me what HTTP codec error looks like now. It's just a sealed trait, right? So it's a sum. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a sealed trait. And the only thing that it really has is like a message. Okay, so for this the is exception. easy to handle exhaustively because now you can say, yes. oh, I'm going to handle all these codec errors. I'm going to turn them all into responses. If we add a field here, like accept header, then a user cannot provide an exhaustive because there's an infinite number corresponding to the number of accept headers. So let's go back. And let's use a map here, just thinking about the simplest possible thing that could work. And don't delete this type, just add a map. We're going to wrap it in a map. And the map is going to go from one of these MIME types to an HTTP codec. Yeah. Understand. Media type. Is it called media type? Yeah, I understand. Okay, so this. now it's just a dumb map. And the map says, if the client wants this air type, this is how I encode it. If it wants this air type, this is how I encode it, and so forth. Yeah, and then and the, also the this question. allows you to say, you know, you you can't handle that media type. Do whatever you want to do, right? So our empty here becomes, and this is nice. It's nice to have an empty because that means this field in endpoint can have a default value, which means if you're yeah. just trying to get something up and running, you don't care about mapping that you can just have something that works, and maybe it auto generates HTML error or something like that just for purposes of getting things running. And then later on, you can say, oh, I'm going to I'm going to specify how I want to handle the JSON error case and the XML error case and the HTML error case. I mean, I mean this is basically what I have already done right. as a default one, right? Exactly, exactly. So uh, here's your homework assignment. Um, prototype, <laughs> push on this a little further. Okay, this seems to get everything we need. 
Um, but we don't know yet until we make a little more progress and we we take advantage of your HTML rendering and whatnot and we see if the pieces fit together. Push on this a little further. And then if you like, you can bring this into uh, a future session and we can see how that yep. decision ended up shaping, shaping up. I, I, I think one important thing here is um, that I have to keep in mind um, so the media types that are in the accept headers are sorted by this Q factor, right? Yes. And that means that um, like the, the media type with Q factor, where is this down here? Uh, yeah. Okay. But, but no, here it, we're it, it not deciding. The type directly. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the, the I, Q I factor thinking... will be useful, but only in deciding like which of these to choose from, which to we can do at a higher us. level. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we, so, so the user, as a user, though, they just want to say, for JSON, I want my errors, my codec errors to be rendered like this. For HTML, I want them to be rendered like this. You know, that's all they want to care about. And then our logic inside the server, it looks at the Q factors and says, oh, well, they would prefer JSON. They would really prefer JSON if it's there. Otherwise, they prefer HTML. We look, we don't find JSON, but we do find HTML. So we, we use the HTML, even though it doesn't have as, as high a Q factor as the JSON. Right, so we can handle that sort of sorting by Q factor in the yeah. server implementation. So, so, so the only thing I, I was thinking about how this media type with Q factor is built, and if I have like a media type directly that I yeah. can compare, or if I need some function to compare, because I definitely don't want to create like a new media type object every time when when I right. uh, want to take a look what's in That's the right. map. That's right. Okay, so I think that this is going to work. But your homework assignment is to push on this and either prove that it doesn't yep. work or get far enough to say, yeah, it's going to work. And then we can take another look at this. Sound good? Then I will, open a then I will update the pull request. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Nabil. It'll be fun to do a, a review yeah. of this at a future symposium. Yeah. Th thank you, too, for your input. OK, uh, fantastic. And now what I will do is briefly run through a few questions. Pierre wants to do name node, name node in Rust rewritten for HDFS. Well, that would be fun. That would be a fun open source project to work on. Flavio says, I'm interested in hearing about your experience distributing bounties to tickets in Zio. Yeah, let's talk about that. We can talk about that in the next session if you like. Uh, I think uh, I think that has some pros and cons, but I've had a really positive experience with the bounty program, I think, and I'll, I'll be happy to share that in the next session. And then Baldwin says, can you elaborate on the log part of the structure? I think we ended up deciding the log part you know, what we're trying to do there with the with the log thing, what Nabil was trying to do with that log part is to just allow the user to uh, do something with that error, which is being produced in pure code. And, and right now it's not obvious how to provide that functionality, but I feel very strongly my gut instinct says, let's rip it out of here and let's solve that problem independently. So we'll try that and then we'll see if we can solve that problem of there was a codec error produced and the user wants to do something sneaky on the side. How do we fit that into the overall sort of declarative machinery that the endpoint mechanism gives you? And then Adrian asks a question about Zio metrics. Uh, we can definitely we can definitely look at Zio metrics. So I would bring that to a symposium if if you like, and we can take a look at that. And then why a map and not a function? Juan asks a great question. Why did I choose a map there? It's because we want a declarative data structure. We want to be able to like in the Open API docs, right? We want to be able to say we can return JSON errors and we can return, you know, HTML errors. We want to be able to totally introspect on that. And also a map is just better for debugging. If you can get away with a map, basically a map is a function. A map is a function whose domain is fixed, finite, and you can enumerate over it. So if you can get away with using a map in a given prom domain, it makes a lot of sense because it gives you a lot more power. And yeah, you could solve that with a partial function as well. But again, a map is better than a partial function if a map makes sense for the use case. So the All problem right. with both function and partial function is, right, you cannot introspect. You cannot yes. take a look yep. in this, at the structure. You just yeah. have to accept that there is some kind of structure somehow that you have to deal with. And if there's an error, you are helpless. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I, I think that and... map is, is, is going to be basically you know the best possible structure we could use for this maps compose right they, they have all these yeah. nice properties they have an empty you can iterate over the keys so you can generate good documentation map really does feel like the right structure to represent that here's my json error here's my html error here's my whatever uh, and you only want 
it has to be a you know a map and not like a list of tuples because you want to be able to say for Jason this is the canonical way you render errors. You don't want to say for Jason well you have your choice of these five different ways to render errors. So a map I do believe is the correct structure. All right, but really great way, set of questions. Go ahead. But, but by the way, if you want to talk about like like bounties, I'm also happy to offer the view from the other side from Fantastic. the ones receiving yes. them. <laughs> that would be helpful. Huh? Well, show up to our next symposium. All right, I want to thank yeah. everyone for showing up. We had a great group of thank attendees you. at this first symposium. I'm very very much looking forward to being the host of this and focusing on amazing ways of building really killer open source libraries and frameworks. So if you've enjoyed this session, then please share the word. We want to get a maximum number of developers along to these things as we can. And of course, all of these videos will be uploaded, edited and uploaded on YouTube and hosted on the Symposium channel, like the uh, older episodes with uh, Adam Frazier and Kit Langton. So see you all at the next uh, Symposium next Friday. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.